Welcome to the Football Show on PLZ Soccer's YouTube channel. I'm Peter Martin. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and join the football family here. Alan Ruff, Lee McCulloch and Tam McManus here with me to talk football and this is what's on the agenda. Head of referee in Crawford Allen insists Scotland have no plans to get rid of VAR with the technology improving the decision making process. Um, it's, it's made the decision making more accurate, that's a fact. We Hearts boss Stephen Naismith believes VAR getting decisions correct is more important than the fan experience. If that impacts the experience of people and a wrong decision goes on the wrong side of my team that we then suffer for it, I'm not interested. Philippe Clement reveals his support of the independent review panel but the Rangers boss hits out at Scotland's pitches. I think it's, it's very important for the game of football that there's transparency, that there's also communication. And Brendan Rodgers admits it's a possibility Lille Abada could leave Celtic in the summer with the winger not in the right frame of mind to... <coughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, not in the right frame of mind. So a big dilemma for uh, Lille Abada and Celtic. Lots to talk about. VAR, weekend Scottish Premiership. And of course, uh, we'll look over our predictions for the games as well. Great to have you back, Lee. Um, obviously, it was raining where you were. Um, you don't, what's I'm happened? not really a sun worshipper. No, honestly. you're not? No, um, no. Okay. Uh, natural, I thought, I thought natural. I thought when he went to Turkey, you know, he came back with the teeth. I thought he might have come back. With I tried to get an extra few couple of teeth in my mouth, but yeah. <laughs> that was enough. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and we were waiting on the uh, Sam Samuel L. Jackson Pulp Fiction here, <laughs> <laughs> but it hasn't quite materialised. Anyway, great to have you back Thank with you. us. Um, VAR. Uh, this is basically a situation where, and I think it's nice and uh, that. We get a situation where the referees talk to the media, talk to the broadcasters, written press and everybody and try and obviously talk to managers and players alike uh, about the decisions. So communication is key. So I think they deserve credit for that. This is a list of the 13 VAR mistakes that they have mentioned that uh, involve certain games. Uh, Liam Boyce penalty in Motherwell Hearts, Ross McCausland penalty in Livingston Rangers. Uh, Will Dennis, red card, Kilmarnock Hearts, Bevis Mugabe, goal against uh, Dundee, Marley Watkins, red card, Abdallah Seema's penalty, Jose Cifuentes, yellow card in the Rangers-Dundee match, Benny Beningame, the red card, Aberdeen against Hearts, Alistair Johnson's handball in Celtic Rangers match, Alan Forrest, penalty, Hearts, Ross County, Rangers against Kilmarnock, the John Souter penalty, St Johnson against Aberdeen, the Graham Carey goal, and Livingston against Dundee, the Zach Robinson goal. Well, that is, uh, at this moment, what they feel they got wrong. I'm sure managers and players could add to that list, Ruffy, but at least they're coming up with 13 that they think we made a mistake. I think they have to. You know, They have to communicate with everybody there. Nobody's going to get it 100% right all the time, but the reason we brought VAR in was to get it 100% right. It isn't working, you know, and that one in the midweek there, the, the one that Aberdeen never got, you know, that's another one you could add to that because that, that was onside. You know, it's difficult. The, goal. The, goal. the last one, the, 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 the one that Aberdeen would have won the game with, mm -hmm. uh, they called it offside, but... Uh, no, I think communication is the biggest thing, you know, and if they're going to communicate, I don't think a lot of the managers will accept it, you know, because it, it's it's decisions like these decisions there, at the end of the day, you're going to sit down and go, well, that could have cost us that, that could have cost us that, that could have cost us that. Right, I'm going to play devil's advocate here, and I'm, I'm probably most referees in the entire SFA board will fall off their chairs um, on this, but when VAR was brought in, as long as everyone was aware of what it was being brought in to do, which was to try and get a greater percentage of the decisions correct. Um, so it was never going to be absolutely flawless. I don't think anybody in their right mind thought that a system operated by humans was going to be flawless because you're open to the interpretation of the referee, you're then open to the interpretation of the VAR referee who's only using technology to give him angles. You're then open to his interpretation to question a referee's decision. What, in my mind, has happened is we have had an increase in the percentage of getting decisions right, but there's still that element where people are looking for perfection, Lee, and I don't think you can get that. There's been 785 VAR reviews 51 have led to on-field reviews, 
24 leading to decisions then being overturned. What are you looking for? Are we looking for perfection? You're not going to get it. I don't think you're going to get it in the early stages of when VARs come in. You're still talking about opinions of the referee, the VAR referee. It comes down to their opinion. So I, I would just like to see a wee bit more clarity with the rules. Um, the handball rule, I think, is still... It needs cleared up. Yes. Um, so you want a rule change to allow the VAR yet again to interpret it yes, properly? Yes, right. and I think before VAR, there's 13 big mistakes here, Ruffy's pointing another one, so 14. Before VAR, how many mistakes were referees making? So it's definitely helped them and cut the amount of mistakes in the game, which therefore has made it better. I don't think it's going to be flawless at this early stage. Early stage, what has it been, a year and a half? Maybe a little bit longer than that, two years, say. It's not going to be... I, I think it's a work in progress. <clears throat> it's exactly what I've said. Crawford Allen reckons that it's, it's certainly heading in the right, decision, uh, the right direction, I beg your pardon. And we'll come back to Crawford Allen in a moment, but it's the point I was <clears throat> making. Yeah, listen, it's, it's, it's improving the decision-making from the referees and the mistakes, you know, I, we're all crying out for it. You know, maybe before VR came in, there was a lot of mistakes and a lot of decisions that people were, were going mental about. Managers, you know, all, all screaming about VAR. You said there 24 have been overturned. So that's 24 mistakes that have initially probably been made uh, by the referee that's been overturned. So there's that, that's got to go into that list as well, the decisions that are getting made that are, that are being corrected. So... No, I, I think it's it's never going to be 100%. We had Stuart Dougal in last week, Peter, and he said that a lot of it's, you know, it's, it's the referee's interpretation of it. You know, it's it's subjective to them um, and the rules. So, no, I, I think that it's, it can get better. But you said three mistakes the first half of the season in 13. <clears throat> Ruffy said maybe 14 in the second part. It should be going the other way. The, the referees in VAR just superb and really good the first part and then mm -hmm. it's levelled off. I think it, you'd rather that the other way has, around. Peter, has the referees ever came out and said who has the, the defining decision? Who well, makes it? Uh, say that when the referee goes to the VAR and he, the VAR people are saying, you need to have an hour look at this. We're looking at it as well. We're seeing something you're not seeing. Can that referee override VAR? Are, are they overriding they're, they're VAR? The, decision yeah, they're, 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 they? the referee is in control of the match. I would love a referee to come out and say, are people putting doubts in my mind? Yeah, but you know, when, right, I'm but when I'm making this decision, are they already saying to me, look, we're just running this by you. We're quite happy if you go ahead with that decision. Yeah, my point here on that, Ruffy, is quite simply, the VAR allows the VAR official to say, we think you've made a clear and obvious error from our mm -hmm. pictures here. Have a look at it. As Lee has mentioned there, he wants the handball situation cleared up. So that involves the SFA referees looking at, should we change that rule? Is, is, there, is there a need for clarification? Or is there a need to change what is a handball effectively? You're talking about here a situation again, which involves, which we don't know. We don't know if the pressure that's coming on board from the VAR is heavily influencing, is it, are they in his ear going, we think you should change it, we think you should have a look, we think you should look at it from this angle. And then of course the other thing that they're doing, Tom, is they're slowing it down frame after frame after frame, another angle, frame after frame after frame, and then the VAR uh, guy... They're showing is, them a still, they're showing well, the referee a still. And then of course the, you could change the intent of a player when mm. you, you know yourself, mm. every one of you knows, mm. sometimes you can carry through, there's no malicious mm. intent, it's just because your body's moving forward. Mm. So that is where we don't know, as Ruffy mentioned, we don't know how much influence they've got to say, you've got to change your mind here. Yeah, I, I think when the referee gets called over to the monitor and it, you know, and everything gets slowed down, everything looks worse in slow motion. You know, they should just be playing at normal speed, <clears> Peter. Yeah. You know, slowing it down and then freezing it, where maybe a guy's falling through after winning the ball and his foot's maybe high. You know, I, I think that that's that's the type of thing that that, that should be that, that shouldn't be happening. Um, so I I would say that definitely in particular that you should be looking at the not be looking at them still and not be looking at it in slow motion. I think the biggest thing of the law is the one Lee handball. 
Hand in hand. I, 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 I don't know how a defender can go out and shut somebody down with his hands behind his back. You know, you, you've, got to be, you've got to be out there, and I think they've got to look at that. And, and Tams, you know, keeps harping on about goals getting disallowed because somebody's hand is in an offside position, yeah. or somebody's heels in an offside mm. position. That's got to be cleared up as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, we do, <laughs> I haven't actually mentioned it for quite a long time, but because we brought the Friday show back live... <laughs> I, I very rarely, you know, I'll mention lots of people who support us and I want to thank so many of you um, who have come on uh, and actually, you know, comment and support us and, and hit the button. But just remember sometimes, if you are posting any message, try not to make uh, statements which are uh, wildly actionable. Um, of course, we don't want abuse. And we don't want any kind of sectarianism or racism. And of course, remember... Referees are human beings and, you know, Janice, if you can, um, have a wee think about your post as well because referees are doing their very best. Um, I think they're getting, you know, a greater percentage right. It's not up at the percentage we all want, um, but they're heading in the right direction. The only thing that I think I would like is that point that you made, Ruffy. How much are they influencing them? Can we make a decision quicker? Can we put a time limit? And can we stop this constant slow frame by frame? You get a yeah. chance to look at it from the angles Don't and you get a chance then to see maybe something that you didn't see, the, call the it. Mistakes in the time limit, I think, is a hard one for them because, unless it's clear. But look, look at doing in England, there's mistakes with VAR <coughs> doing in England. They've got twice the amount of cameras and they've got full-time referees and there's still mistakes there. So there's, look at her, we've got half the cameras they've got and we've got part-time referees. So it makes it more difficult for the referee. But, yeah, I, I think it's on the up anyway. That That's my perspective. No, I'd, I'd have loved some of the referees who refereed uh, last week in the Scottish Cup and didn't have VAR, if they thought it was more comfortable or not. Some of the I, grounds I, I didn't have did. a Partick Thistle didn't did have too. VAR. Ruffy. And I loved if the referee came off and went, well, all the decisions I made were mine. Less scrutiny then. Yeah. Ruffy, a former decisions top a former <clears> top <throat> manager was at a game I was at two weeks ago in midweek. And he's still managing now, maybe not at the, the height he was managing, still managing and he went, ah, it's great. He says, I'm going to watch a game without VAR. And I looked at him and I thought, wow, he, that's his feeling and others feeling this. <clears throat> By the way, and do you, know why I'm, do you know why I wasn't in any way critical of him? Because some of these decisions that we're looking at, Tam, can actually have a major bearing on their career. I know it sounds really, really you know, dramatic, mm -hmm. but sometimes a win or a loss could be the difference between a manager getting the sack or, or three crucial points. Yeah, it is now, you know, <laughs> particularly now with the, the scrutiny that managers are under. You know, you're only three, four, five games away from getting the sack or people calling for your head. Uh, I noticed that none of those none of those decisions, none of those mistakes were Hibs were involved. Uh, I think they were the only one of the only clubs in that and all those mistakes that weren't involved. So they the manager can't have a I moan about decisions, you know, nothing's went against him in, in terms of that, but no, you're right, particularly in the bigger game, Celtic Rangers, you know, you've got to get the big decisions right, but no, listen, I, I like it, but I don't think it's great to watch, Peter, I think that when you look at a championship game, I'll, I'll watch Wraith Rovers Dundee United tonight, and I'll watch it thinking there's no VR, and it just, I think just watching a game, you know, in terms of managers, managers and players that are involved in it now, we're, we're not obviously involved, I think it's good because you know that most of the decisions are going to get called right. You're not going to get done with a big decision, you would think. But with, with, with the championship, you can just... Do, do, do you know what I mean? But there's VAR. No, the, no, chances, the chances are lessened. Back. The chances are lessened of you of, of <coughs> getting a big decision against you. With all, with all due respect, Tam, <coughs> honestly, two years ago we were on this programme and you're all bleating on and I am... Oh, I wanted VAR I'm, in. I'm there. I'm there with you. I'm guilty of it. I'm saying VAR on the basis that you've got to listen to the referee who said at the time, it is going to get a greater percentage of the decisions correct. So to suddenly then go back to a position that you're taking of, oh, well, he's going to get the majority of them right and it's human error. We were always battering them on the basis of they only had a millisecond to look at it and call it. And if they've got it wrong, everybody's torching the referee. I think when you go back to then, everybody was crying out for 
for VAR to come in. Now that it's in, everybody's picking holes in it. It's in a much better place to where we were back then, although it does, like Tam says, takes a little bit of the excitement out of the game. Absolutely, and that's obviously something that you've mentioned, which I think is we all want people to celebrate a goal. Mm. Now you never know where you are with it, and and also the slow, the slow decision making is killing it as well, uh, which I think a lot of people are hacked off with. Uh, fingers crossed. Let's hear what um, Crawford Allen had to say on it. Right, I've missed Crawford Allen. I've, I've gone to him for the second time and he ain't there, so I'm not going back to it. Um, OK, um, Crawford Allen says they're moving in the right direction. <laughs> <laughs> there you are. OK, um, Stephen A. Smith, he says he, he doesn't care um, about the fans' aspect on it. He just wants the right decisions. No, because I think the stats and the facts show that we're getting better, more decisions right than wrong. So, in my, I, I totally agree that... It, it impacts the experience, but from my position, if that impacts the experience of people and a wrong decision goes on the wrong side of my team that we then suffer for it, I'm not interested. I want us to get the best decision, the right decision. Now, whether the, the way we do this, or the way it's implemented changes, that's not my position to take that, but I think it, it has got a place um, in the game. It's just about being more consistent, getting better decisions, and, and that does take time. Yeah, OK. I, I, I like that attitude to it, Ravi, do you? Mm -hmm. The same attitude they had after Forrest pulled in for the penalty, <laughs> was he <laughs> saying? <laughs> he was going mental. Uh, but no, I, 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 if you're a manager and you think the decisions are going against you all the time, you know, it can be frustrating and I'm sure there'll be some people at some clubs looking at all the wrong decisions and deciding how many points they would have had in the league a mm. lot more. They'll be analysing every bit, oh, that, like, Tam's done it already. It wasn't the Hibs. Mm. Hibs weren't in it, but there mm. will be club people at clubs mm. going, that could have been two points, three mm. points, that could have been. Yeah. And that's unfortunate where the referees are. But the bottom line is, we, I think we all agree, it's, it's getting better. OK. Um, Rangers and five other clubs in the SPFL I um, obviously want to speak to the SPFL in a crisis meeting. Rangers, Aberdeen, Livingston, Motherwell, St Johnston and St Mirren have called for a meeting. Um, all the SPFL member clubs were invited to a meeting at 11 on February 27th and it was confirmed today that Murdoch McLennan and Neil Doncaster will now meet with the top flight clubs next week instead. Um, the six clubs have raised fears over the way the league is being run. Um, so clearly... They're not happy. They feel as if maybe one club is getting, you know, most of the information that should have been to all the clubs. Yeah, we spoke about it last week. I think that Rangers in particular have been gunning for Neil Doncaster for a while now, um, and Murdoch McLennan for that, for that matter. And, you know, they're going to meet. I don't see why it's just the, the top flight clubs are going to meet. Why is it not everyone? Um, I think everyone's obviously got a decision. Uh, to make so I think it should be everyone that's meeting not just the top flight clubs but I think it's good to be to be clear and open I don't think there should be anything being hidden by Neil Doncaster the SPFL Murdo McLennan whatever it is I think it's good to everyone around the table and the six clubs that have had the gripe with the SPFL and, and those two guys get to see their piece and get to be open and transparent about it so I think it will stop a lot of cloak and dagger stuff that's maybe Rangers have been insinuating in the last couple of seasons that's been happening with SPFL and particularly the two guys that's been mentioned there. And to offer a, a sense of balance on this, Ruffy, quite simply, the six clubs can come forward and actually then um, Murdoch McLennan and Neil Doncaster can lay in front of them, mm -hmm. here's the process that we followed, mm -hmm. here's the legalities of what decision we made, um, and then if you want to pick faults in it, Put your case forward. That's that's it, the same that you can do for any business. Yeah, it'd be interesting uh, for all of us to know what the individual clubs' complaints are. I'm sure they won't all won't be the same. They'll have different uh, questions they want answers for. But if they go into that room and that rule book gets thrown out there, they'll be there for hours because <laughs> it'll be subsection 24. <laughs> uh, uh, oh yeah, this will be it'll be mental. Well, <laughs> well, they will because they'll just get yeah. baffled. They'll just get. I don't, I don't we'll think they'll be baffled this. by the way. I think they'll be in there, you know, legaled up. Yeah. It's as simple as that, uh, Lee. Um, the one thing that I do think, I, I think the SPFL, I think it needs to, 
I needs to. I think it needs not not so much modernise itself. I think it needs to change the structure um, and also change the strategy and try and look for harmony, but in a fairer way and change the structure of the voting system, especially in the top flight, this 11-1 vote. Um, I think there's lots of areas where if they had an internal review and said, right, we've got to, we've got to try and change because it's difficult times, it's a recession. There are the, the, you know, the broadcasting world is changing. There, everybody's fighting for money and everybody across Europe is worried that they're now looking at the richest league in the world and they're being left behind at all levels. Super clubs are struggling to keep pace with English Premier League. Clubs that you would have associated that might have got into the latter stages of European football with great reputations, great histories, are struggling to keep pace. We've got to work out a way where we're all unified, moving in the same direction so that we can go out there and get more sponsorship money, more broadcast money, a wider audience, instead of some of the infighting that we are still witnessing and we have witnessed all the way back to COVID and before that. I think that's the biggest thing, the infighting is the biggest thing for me. Everybody's pulling in different directions then. If, hopefully for this meeting they get together and then every, there's transparency there, everybody will be on the same boat, so to speak and then you can go in the one direction, especially when there's all this infighting and it's public infighting. Um, so I think after this meeting there's got to be a get together, how can we make the league better, how can we change the voting system as, as you've mentioned as well. Um, but I don't think we'll ever, ever be in comparison to the English Premier League. No, absolutely. But it's if we were all unified, Ruffy, yeah. and looking at things more positively and try and work out how can we get money for the collective rather than being, you know, almost subservient to individual clubs who are greedy well, and that, think uh, about themselves. Well, every time a, a vote comes round, that's what it is. Everybody's looking after themselves. I think we all sat here and we have been, and I'm sure if you asked half of our league, would they want it rejigged? You know, more teams in the league. I think the majority would say, yeah, let, let's get another four in, let's play more games, let's see more younger players getting playing for teams. Unfortunately, you know, when the voting system comes round, as we've discussed the way it is just now, it doesn't seem to be able to get by. Yeah, um, OK, I think we obviously value your opinion on this. What would you like to see change from SPFL and, of course, uh, overall um, the structure? Um, does it need a revamp? Do we need to modernise it? Do we need to try and get some kind of peace um, at the top end among the top clubs to try and move forward. Um, certainly difficult times um, and certainly the squabbling does nobody any favours. Interesting to see what comes out of that meeting because I, I have to say my gut feeling, just as we finish on this time before we look at the Premiership games, my gut feeling is those six clubs will go in, make their case and then be quickly belted out into left field by the legalities of any process and procedure that was followed. Ruffy spoke that somebody that's been on the board, the directors, and maybe been party to SPFL meetings and WhatsApp chats, so he will know what's going on. Yeah. Uh, with, with WhatsApp chats? <laughs> <laughs> so he will know what's about to go, because you're right, I think you're bang on. I think the SPFL will go in. I think Neil Doncaster, Murdo McLennan and the SPFL will go in and they'll have everything. Yeah. All, the, all the ducks in a row, they know what's coming for the yeah. six clubs. Just before we move on to the Scottish Premiership, I feel as if it's only right and proper that we um, keep uh, Lee up to date on Ruffy and the Skullduggery because Lee joined us after yeah. the Skullduggery when Ruffy was on the board and they were all WhatsApping each other to work out which way they were voting and everything. There was a real... The Dundee email that got lost and stuff like that. You know, all this. Ruffy. 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 It got nothing to do with us. Lost the, 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 the party at Thistle Walk. <laughs> really? Oh, and honestly, it was, <coughs> it was unbelievable. The only thing that was missing on their WhatsApp group was, when you've read this message, it'll self-destruct in 10 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there was all sorts of skullduggery. And by the way, can I just say something to you? When eventually, um, you know, Tam, yourself and me um, get the boot, there will be a message that he'll have sent out to somebody and then that's, that's the way he's operating. You know? um, we've, we've had players like that in the dressing room before. Um, okay, 
uh, Scottish Premiership. Here's the fixtures for you to look at and look forward to over the weekend. It's Aberdeen against Hibs, Celtic, Kilmarnock, Dundee against Ross County, Hearts against Motherwell, Livingston, St Mirren and St Johnston against Rangers. Uh, it's really hotting up now, Ruffy, uh, at the top end. It certainly is. Uh, obviously, we had, a, we had a wee gap there two or three months ago, which isn't there now. You know, the momentum seems to have swung uh, a wee bit in Rangers' favour. I think the fans at Rangers will be happy with the signings they brought in uh, in the window there and uh, the results that they've been having. Very positive. It'll be interesting. I think it's... We, when Celtic were so far ahead, we kept saying Rangers just need to slip up once. They just need to... It's the, I think it's changed now. I think the pressure's now on Celtic. Everybody's looking at Celtic now. When we slip up to give Rangers more momentum to maybe go ahead, so... It's up to both of them, obviously, to keep winning games. And I think, from a neutral point of view, I think that's great. You know, it makes it makes the league a lot more competitive and interesting in every game. Yeah, could be a good game uh, this weekend at Celtic. <coughs> Celtic against Kilmarnock. Um, the update on Celtic's injury front: Greg Taylor and Lille Abada are back in training. However. Uh, Brendan Rodgers had said that uh, Leila Bada may need to move away from Celtic. Um, this uh, was indeed his quotes from today. People can talk about it, the conflict, and then forget. But this is the reality for him. It's his life. When he's ready, if he's ever ready, he'll give us everything. Uh, might he have to look for a move or a loan? It's a possibility. We'll work together on it. Well, I think it's and without treading through... Um, the very difficult situation which is um, Israel and uh, Palestine um, I think it, it's it's a difficult situation for Leela Bada because quite simply I'm not going to say who's right or who's wrong in the conflict because any life is massive <clears throat> to me regardless of race, creed or colour but Leel Abada is in a situation where maybe he's looked at Palestinian flags, banners. He's an Israeli internationalist and an Israeli boy who feels that right now maybe he's getting a lot of displeasure mm -hmm. from agents and families at the stands, the Green Brigade, and many others have taken, not just the Green Brigade. And it's a dilemma for the boy, very, very difficult. Yeah, as in, and listen, if, if, if you're not happy, you know, off the field and you've got issues and you're not going to show your best on the <coughs> field, I obviously come back from injury and I don't think he's been quite at it. A lot of the Celtic wingers haven't been at it, but for him, he, he's, he's, a real, he's a real great prospect as well. He's still a young player, you know, he's got a great record in terms of goals and assists. The first couple of seasons he was at Celtic, under, particularly under Ange. Uh, but you've, you've got a sympathy for him because, you know, as you said to me, as, as countries at war with another country and the Celtic fans are, you know, producing flags and banners of the country, you know, that has his own countries at war with. So it can't, it can't be doing him any good. And as you said, he's probably getting social media, he's getting messages from people from Israel and stuff like that. And, you know, his head's probably up, up his backside at the minute. So I, I think for him, possibly at the end of the season, whether it's a loan or, or a a permanent move. I think maybe it's the best for everyone. Maybe it's the best for the club. Maybe it's the best for him that he goes somewhere else and plays. But Celtic will be looking for, still be looking for top money for him because I think he's a player still with great potential. Yeah, I, I, I mean, Ruffy, when you when you consider sometimes when they do get the ball wide, he's <coughs> one of those players who at times has shown a real potential in saying, I'm going to play it quickly. I'm going to put it in with one touch. And, he, you know, Celtic have benefited from that and scored goals from it. So he can only get better. <coughs> yes, and uh, but it, again, it just goes back to football players being ordinary human beings like everybody else. They all have to deal with troubles away from football. And uh, some players can deal with diversity behind them. Some can put it away and go on when you go in the park, you concentrate on what you're doing. And obviously other individuals can't. He seems to come into that category. Uh, and you have to feel sorry for the boy if because he'll, he'll want to play football. He'll want to do his best for the club and his teammates and everything. But you're right. I, I think when he was on forum and Jota was on forum, Kyogo was banging goals left, right and centre. It's obvious that they two aren't there anymore and he's struggling a wee bit. 
We're coming up against Kilmarnock and Kelly sit just one point ahead of St Mirren. Of course, they've beaten Celtic twice at Rugby Park. Celtic managed a 3-1 win at their own home. Is there a wee shock on the cards? Alison McConnell was in the Kilmarnock camp. Kilmarnock manager Derek McInnes says his job this week has been akin to a salesman as he gets a message through to his players that they are more than capable of going to Celtic Park and getting a result against Brendan Rodgers' side. They have, of course, already beaten Celtic this term, however. It's possibly a different proposition doing it in the backyard of the reigning champions. I think my job, a lot of the time, when you go to Celtic Park, is to be the best salesman I can be with my players. It's to try and sell them, tell them that we can do this and have that belief. The main ambition, of course, for Kilmarnock is to ensure they finish in that top six and cement the place with McInnes wary of just how quickly things can change when there's so little between the teams. Well, we're happy where we are at the minute. We can't just feel as though that we've done enough and tiptoe and try to hope to get into the top six. It's the team that finds form now that will get there and it's important that we try and raise our levels, try and raise the um, um, standard of our play and keep that um, show that we will really just keep driving the club into the top six. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the great thing about um, the, the show, it's only been going 11 years and Ruffy still talks all the way through every every manager, even when they're chatting. <laughs> Ruffy, what did you make of what McKinnis had to say? I, thought, I, I was going to say of all the teams, I think he's strengthened his team <laughs> more than everybody else. And I was just saying to Lee there just before. <laughs> 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 Yeah, sure Evan Van Veen, you know, for Billy Bowie, who obviously has got a big say in what happens at Kilmarnock, uh, has got right behind the team, and I think it's an important sign. Yeah. Um, OK, give us your prediction. Yeah, I'm going to go 2-0 Celtic. OK. I like the way Dell speaks, I really do, and he's saying he's got to sell the message and enhance the team again. He's done that since he's come in. But I don't think they'll have enough going to Celtic Park. Um, I think it'll be 2 nothing Celtic. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be tighter. I think it might be 2-1. I'll go for 2-1 to Celtic. I think come on, I've, I've got enough options in the final third you know, to, to cause Celtic problems, particularly in the full-back area. So I think the command will score, but Celtic might just nick it. I think it'll be a very tight game. Here's a good question for you. Derek, uh, you know, I think we all respect him as a manager. Has he... Has he built a better team now than maybe some of the teams that he put together at Aberdeen? Because you look at the look at the options he has. He's got good options in that team, hasn't he? Yeah, he has. But listen, he finished runner up in the, in the Premier League with Aberdeen and got to I think two or three, maybe more than that cup finals. Obviously, run, run up against a, a really good Celtic team. So the jury's still out in terms of where they finish at the end of the season. But I think they'll definitely be in the top six. I don't think they'll catch Hearts now. But even if they finish fourth, that might be enough for Europe, Peter. So. I think, when you, as you said, I think you look at I mean, the options he's got now. You know, Kevin Van Veen and there, Daniel Armstrong must be in the running for player of the year. I think he's been exceptional this season. And it's a great opportunity for him to go and probably maybe Steve Clark watching. You know, maybe he's got a wee opportunity to force his way into that Scotland squad in the next couple of friendlies. And these are the games where you've got to go and produce. You go to Parkhead, you go to Ibrox. I think he scored a penalty earlier in the season against, against Rangers. But if he goes to Celtic Park and plays well, maybe scores. And Steve Clark must be having a wee look at him. Yeah, OK. St John's and Rangers, you've gone away on holiday suddenly. <laughs> You're back. Rangers are, are level <laughs> at the top. We've got a race on now, haven't we? Ah, it's, it's brilliant. <clears throat> Absolutely brilliant for the neutral. Um, one goal in it. Uh, momentum, probably. If we were talking two and a half months ago, we're saying Celtic. Celtic's going to do it. It's a foregone conclusion. I think that, Ruffy said it earlier, the full momentum shift went the op opposite way and the Rangers are looking as if they're getting better and better they're really good against Ross County and Celtic are the ones that are looking like they need to get to the Old Firm game without dropping a point to leave a chance to again get that gap but Rangers just need to keep winning obviously so do Celtic but it's alright getting the, a manager bounce and then going on a run it's sustaining that run. It's keeping, and I think that I think the manager is deserves all the credit. Um, dealing with a lot of the players that he didn't sign at the the start when he first came in, that signed for the previous manager, they were low in confidence. They they were looking like they weren't going to make an impact, put it that way. And Clement's come in and he's rejuvenated, he's gave confidence, he's brought the fans back to really make Ibrox a fortress again. And um, Tough game tomorrow. So 
But I think they'll they'll have enough Sunday game is obviously. I think I think they'll have enough. Um, <coughs> Johnson will sit tight. That Rangers have got pace out wide, um, and Dessers who's flying the new. Um, I, another one that was, was getting a hell of a lot of stick. He's he's proved that he, he can get in amongst the goals. His movement's really good. I think he's third top goal scorer isn't he, in the league. So. Yes, I, I think I think it will be three one Rangers. Yeah, and um, just out of curiosity, and I've got a stamp in my pocket. Could you write on the back of it the neutrals that you know? Do you know any neutrals? I'm sitting there going, "Do know any neutrals? You've never, you've never met a neutral in your life." <laughs> <laughs> so, um, of course, when you're a Rangers or a Celtic manager, when there's some hotly contested issues, Philip Clement will be well used to being asked questions that maybe don't concern overall the team. It might be the review panel, uh, might be pitches. Adam Biddy was out there to find out. The Scottish FA announced yesterday that an independent review panel had adjudged there to be a further 13 key match incidents which reached the incorrect outcome made by match officials. Four of those incidents involved Rangers Football Club. So we spoke to their manager, Philip Clement, this afternoon, who was grateful for the transparency. I think it's, it's very important for the game of football that there's transparency, that there's also communication. And I, I think it's important that... There can be more communication between, for example, referees and managers a few times a season, let's say two, three times a season, outside of the games. Rangers travel to Perth to face St. Johnson on Sunday, where they have struggled with the playing surface in the past. Manager Philip Clement has been in Scotland for four months and thinks that if Scottish football is to improve, then the pitches must improve too. The better football you give, the more money you will get from television also because people will like to watch that more than when the ball bounces uh, three times every pass you give because you don't have a good product. So it's, it's an important thing uh, to, to raise the standards in that way. I must admit, I don't know what clubs can do, Ruffy, because Motherwell had one of the best pitches in the country and, and, and Celtics was a hybrid that they spent a lot of money on, hearts equally so. It's just, I mean, has it been a bad winter where it's just caught, Where are they going on Sunday, out? though? They're going to St John'son Sunday, aren't they? Yeah. That's one of the worst pitches. Yeah, I thought St Mullins Park was poor last week as well. Yeah, but I mean, what, but, but has there been There's a... There's nothing you can do, it's been, has, the, the winter's been horrific. I mean, well, the winter's been, the winter's been bad, but has there been a, a, a lack of attention? Has there been a cutback conscientiously by clubs to say, listen, we can't spend that money that we usually do right across the board. I don't know, but th there seems to be all of a sudden in the last three weeks, every manager's talking about the state of the pitches. No, I think the pitches have generally been okay, Peter. I think, as you said, Motherwell's excellent surface. The Hibs have got a good surface at the minute. Uh, Hearts, Celtics is poor. I think that, that's the big one for me. You know, Brendan Rodgers been, seems to be bleating about it every week. You know, he's not happy because he can't play with the pace, the speed of play. No balls bobbling up all over the place. I thought St Mullins was poor last week. And we've got two plastic pitches as well with Kilmarnock and Livingston. So you might get one of them. I think Kilmarnock are possibly going to grass next year and you might Livingston looks as if they're going down and they might be able to, to change that rule. Everybody's got grass when Livingston goes. So, no, nah, I, I don't think there's been... In particular, and The weather's been terrible this winter. I think it's difficult for groundsmen and groundswomen to, to keep up with the pitch. And, and that's, that's been an issue as well. So... But I think the main, the main one for me is Celtic. I think it's, it's affecting them, particularly at home. They can't move the ball at speed. Yeah, absolutely. Which, um, and I'm not talking about Celtic here because I don't want to go down that alleyway, but I'm just going to say to you, Ruffy, I mean, what a load of clap I'm not I mean, honestly. me too. I mean, I know, I'm late. coming at you. I know. Coming honestly, in. if you're a half decent player, oh, you can play in any God. pitch. What's your touch like? We all, we all want to see good pitches and we all want to play in good pitches, but if you've got any kind of ability at all, you should be able to adapt. You know, and just get on with it, yeah. you know, because, I mean, I know I go way back 40, 50 years, but I've, I've seen players playing in mud and they look magnificent. Yeah. They don't complain about it. Absolutely. You know, I, don't, I, mean, I think Tanner Dice never had any grass on the park for about half the season. Yeah. Sand, you know, Kamarnock was the same and everybody got on with it and everybody, the football, okay, the mistakes were made like, like anything, but yeah. come on. Yeah, we in Guy's piece, so we ain't work on your touch, by the way. Um, I, was, I, I once watched Davy Cooper on a muddy pitch and he managed to control it and then with the outside of his boot, um, you know, 
set somebody up for a goal. Uh, I watched Kendrick Leach take a ball at 50 mile an hour, boom, first touch immaculate, second touch back of the net. You know what? I love McKenny. <laughs> you want to see Jimmy Johnson? Unbelievable. And as, uh, as, as, John, as Jonathan Watson used to say, Jimmy Johnson was that good, he could keep Kenny Douglas up in a bouncy castle. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I think St Johnson are going to get spanked. 3 0 Rangers. 3 0 Rangers. Did I say 2 0? 3 1, you said 3 1. 2 0. 2 0. He's all over it, by the way. He doesn't want you getting into the top 10. <laughs> um, okay. Aberdeen Hibs. Aberdeen 9. 3 3 draw with Mullow. I'd love to have been a fly in the wall in that oh. dressing room, Ruffy, with Neil Warnock, would you? I'd have liked to have been a fly in the wall on the, on the, on the touchline after 38 minutes. <laughs> Uh, he made the changes quick, you know, and uh, it worked out for him. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Eh? But uh, some of the goals are losing, and that's been the same all season for Aberdeen. We know they can score goals, but some of the goals they can see are, are ridiculous. I think the goalie's got to take a bit of blame in that. He was my keeper of the year last year. I thought he was absolutely magnificent. Well, it looks a shadow, but, you say. But I, I, you know why? Well, that's just my opinion. Sometimes you look a shadow of yourself if the four in front of you <laughs> aren't particularly 100%. You know, mm. they, they're all so over. It so so mind yeah, that, if you know somebody's strength, sort of you know somebody's strengths and weaknesses, you yeah. know he's going to win this boss coming in and he's going to win that but I don't think Aberdeen have ever been like that in the centre of defence for a couple of seasons yeah. a couple? you know maybe three yeah um, <laughs> they brought in Junior Hoyle now I like what Neil Warnock it who was in front of me I wasn't coming anyway <laughs> <laughs> I like what Neil Warnock's done here and I think a number of clubs maybe um, and I hope he, he, he lives up to his hype Junior Hoyle is a 33-year-old Canadian international. He's worked with uh, Neil Warnock before. Um, and Neil Warnock himself has brought him in uh, to Aberdeen. He was out of contract at the end of his uh, campaign playing football abroad. So they were able to bring him in. And uh, I think Warnock's looking forward to what he can do. He's just a, he's a calming influence, if, I, if I'm honest. Um, you know, he's not going to... He's not going to knock the doors down and everybody, but he's a very, very good... Um, I always call him Mr. 8 out of 10. And uh, I have had a few 10s out of him over, over the time I've had him. Uh, a few 6s as well, I suppose. Um, but in general, he's a very calm influence. Nice lad as well in the dressing room. Yeah, a wee bit of experience, Lee. You can't beat that. Can't beat it, and it adds a little bit of freshness. Um, when you were a younger footballer, did somebody come in who was experienced? Did you remember somebody coming in and you thought, oh, he's made me think about that differently? Tommy Coyne. Remember Tommy Coyne? Yeah. John Spencer, Don Goodman, all these. Well, I was really lucky I had a good dressing room. But I think <coughs> with Warnock, bringing him in adds a little bit of freshness. He's one of Warnock's guys, so if there's anything going on in that dressing room, I'd imagine Hoy Little Big and Mark. Yeah. <laughs> I'm telling you. Is he spy? Yeah. Little bit. I'm not saying. <clears throat> well, it's a bad guy, but just getting the, the sense of the dressing room as well. Um, I, I can see, st we're, I think we're all still waiting in Aberdeen properly kicking on. Um, They've had a bad season domestically, and uh, when Walnuts came in, he was looking to obviously get the instant impact. I don't think he's had that, albeit coming down for three goals, but to lose the three goals is, was poor. Um, I think once they get that first win, start on that upward trajectory. Mm. Big word. Yeah. Uh, it was a good point Lee made there. Was there any clubs you were at you thought there was a player in the dressing room at the manager's ear? No. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the easy answer. And so that's you know that would <laughs> Can you imagine? You'd be away up the stairs again. <laughs> I, remember, I remember I was only, I was only a kid. At, I was only a kid at Hibs at just coming in and Greg Muller was Alec Muller's boy. Oh, God. Aye. He was in the dressing room and nobody, nobody spoke about the, the manager and he was a bit of one of the ones. Yeah. Yeah. Been awesome. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, here's a good point that Ewan Montgomery, I'm quite happy to take this in the chin. Um, Ewan says, Peter's saying he wants more young Scottish players playing, but then likes that Neil Warnock brings in a 33 year old Geese Peace man. Um, I mean, I do really want more uh, Scottish players playing. I want to see more Scottish players playing. If there's a if there's an experienced Scottish player that they they could come, you know, go out there. There's lots of good experienced Scottish pros. You know, I remember um, only last year, two years. I, I thought. Um, 
Robert Snodgrass coming in just offered a wee bit of calmness and you know he, he made five and ten yard passes look simple at times you know you were there um, sometimes it's good to bring a bit, a bit of experience Aberdeen and Aberdeen for me at times at the back end are a shambles and you know sometimes I've looked at them and I've, I've seen them about three or four times in the last two months and they're dire to watch so if it's got to be a 33 year old Canadian then I, I think the point He's getting, the, he's the, getting the them because he's been, out of contract. He's and getting them out of contract, the window's shut, it somebody trusts. Now, for, for, to see more youth, it, it, it's hard. It, it obviously thinks, and the coaching staff that have been there for years, obviously think there's nobody in the reserves, 23s, 18s, that are good enough to play first-team football, or they would already be there. They've been getting, look where they're in the league. Yeah. So they've needed something. Uh, and I think w when it comes back to, and look at the, the Motherwell manager, Stuart Kettlewell, when he came in, he threw Lennon Miller in there, and that one got lucky. Yeah. You know, but I, I think a lot of managers, because of the, the way football is worldwide now, five defeats away from the sack, it's hard. It's hard to bleed young players now. Well, it's so exactly what Stephen Robinson said on Monday. But, but we're going on about the... The change of voting, the, the, the rule changes and more transparency. Can they change a rule where you need to go back to the three, remember the three subs? Uh, yeah, the three. three homegrown uh, subs and you need to maybe put one or two of them on every game. I don't know. Yeah, it's just something to I, get them on the pitch. I'd love that I'd love that to happen early, but what happened was they were just sitting gathering yeah, we're just wasting time but on the You have bench. to put them on. Yeah, I'd love to see that. But but you have to play one know, per yeah, you have to play one. <coughs> yeah. And then they'd moan <coughs> about it because they were getting battered. Um what about your uh, guys, uh, the high bees? Uh, and we're talking about experience, but Paul Hanlon and, and Lewis Stevenson have they've got the stripes on the shirt they know they're going to leave in the summer it's a new manager with new thinking you know they've done their bit for Hibs I just think now he needs to look and try and get a back line that's that's a new back line yeah it's, it's going to be it's going to be a difficult one I think for every Hibs supporter when when the time comes for for, for both Paul and Lewis Stevenson to, to move on I think for in terms of Paul Hanlon he, he might get another year I think centre half as a position where you could play a little bit older rather than a fullback or a wide area. I think you need more legs in the wide areas. I think for Paul, there's a possibility of maybe him, maybe him getting another year. Uh, I think for Lewis, I think it'll be time for him in the summer to move on. And listen, that you could easily build a statue of Lewis Stevenson outside Hibs. You know, he's won yeah. two trophies, the Scottish Cup and the League Cup. I think he's the only player, <laughs> living player to do that. And Would you put it on a big plinth? I'd put it on a big plinth right outside Lewis Stevenson. I think he's been a tremendous servant. But... Time waits for no man, and I think for both of them, possibly Paul as well, it'll be time to move on. It'll be, do they want to hang about and be bit part players? Do they, particularly for, for Paul Hanlon, uh, or do they want to go and play somewhere in the last couple of seasons of their career? But interesting game, Hibs against Aberdeen. I think Nick Montgomery's gone up against his old gaffer. I think he had Neil Warnock was his <coughs> gaffer at, at Sheffield United for a long time, gave him his debut. And that'll be strange for him uh, to come up against a guy who he probably has tons of respect for and who gave him his debut in, in league football. So I fancy Hibs in this game, Peter. I think that Aberdeen, everybody keeps waiting for Aberdeen. To, they're going to hit a run, they're going to hit a run. I don't see it at the minute. Uh, I think they're very reliant on one player uh, in Miofsky. And I think Hibs, Hibs have beaten twice this season. I think Hibs can make it three and go up there and one, two one. Two one of Hibs? Yeah. Oh, hmm. that could be the change and that could be the slippery slope for him, by the way. He's great, doing well, actually. Yeah, he's doing well, he's but this away. is the moment when... Yeah, I think so. ...starts mm -hmm. what you going? Yeah, I'm going to go. I'm sitting in the fence, I draw. I think that comeback for Aberdeen will just give them the momentum to get something out of the game and that'll be a draw. OK, you jig quickly? Jig. OK, the one thing that I was going to say to you, and I think Hibs deserve tremendous credit, stadium improvements have been announced, um, safe standing in the famous five mm. lower tier. I think that's going to be great. Redevelopment of the famous five stand. Uh, internal space will have a, a, a new sports bar. They've okay. they've really developed well. They're, they're maximising the income. I'm surprised, actually, that Hibs haven't tried to follow suit with Hearts and maybe look at one of the corners and build a hotel in there. Mm. Because there's a huge space where they could do that. It would be really, really... Uh, good for them. Yeah, there's, um, there's a lot of space at Easter Road, Peter, in terms of the corners. You're right. You know, you could put something in there. Yeah. But uh, in terms of the hospitality, I've not been to the hospitality hubs, but I know people who have, 
and they're not Hibs supporters. I just went through with their companies and hospitality, <coughs> and they said it's absolutely tremendous. It's one of the best in Scottish football. The food, you know, the way you're treated, the service, everything is fantastic at Hibs off the field. It just needs to click on the field for them. Here's something that you don't have, and Hearts don't have it either. Just quickly, who would you put a, a statue of outside? Would it be a David Gray, an Eddie Turnbull, a Pat Stanton? Who deserves a who deserves a statue out there? Uh, Hibs. Uh, Pat Stanton, I yeah. think he's probably one of the greatest, or if not the greatest Hibs players ever played with him. I wasn't around with the famous five, but Pat Stanton and Lou, Steven, Lou Stevenson have been in the mix as well. Peter, he's, he's won two cups. I think he's the only living player. I think he's the only Hibs player in history that's won two Scottish Cup and a, and a, and a League Cup. For Hibs. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a good shout, isn't it, Ruffy? I know yeah. you think yourself, because you obviously. No, I mean, I got an invite to the hospitality being a Hall of Famer at yeah. Hibs, so and it is a beautiful stadium. It's great. How many years were you at Six. Six years. Yeah. Only took him six to be a Hall of Famer. Lee, that's how. <laughs> if, 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 if he if he build a statue of him, I'll just urinate again. <laughs> <laughs> you really need. To, you really need to help. So you, you need to help. You oh, honestly. Well, you uh, have got a track record, by the way. Yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> a very, good, very good point, Ruffy. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Shame on the club. <laughs> so. Uh, uh, hearts against Motherwell. Hearts third, 12 points ahead of fourth place, Kelly. Um, it's all rosy in the garden, so Patrick Mullen was out there to find out what Stevie Naismith had to say. I'm here at the Orium this morning speaking to Stephen Naismith as his side are preparing to take on Motherwell. It's a Motherwell side that blew a three-goal lead during the week away at Patodri against Aberdeen. But despite this, Stephen Naismith is bracing his players for an incredibly tricky game. And I think the game at Tynecastle at the start of the season they get the better of is just a mixture of our, our schedule playing in Europe but they set up well and, and they caused us problems. A victory tomorrow for Hearts would see them go 12 games unbeaten in all competitions but despite this fabulous run of form Stephen Naismith insists the job is far from over. We take each game as it comes. Uh, I've been asked about, about looking at the league table and stuff like that and I've, we'll look at it at the end of April May time. Um, it's about winning your games, which inevitably will create a gap below you. And if you keep winning your games, it will make you catch teams above you. It's Hearts versus Motherwell tomorrow, and it kicks off at 3pm at Tyne Castle Park. And PLZ Soccer will be there live, keeping you up to date. OK, uh, please forgive me for this, Lee, but sometimes if you are in a rush and you're going to do your job and you just you just stick your hand in the cupboard and, and then you pull out your mum's coat. And it's dark. And it's dark. And you can't see what jacket you fooled it. You is just, that where you're just going with fire right out. Yeah, that was a hell of a jacket. It, it really is. <laughs> is I mean, if that camera panned down and there was high heels, I would not have been surprised. <laughs> <laughs> it was just absolutely magnificent, wasn't it? Well done to Patrick. He's, he's, he's not in any way... Wavering. Shoulder pads in there, aren't oh, there? it's fantastic. Right, you're 1983. Honestly, I mean, if he doesn't get a chance to go on tour with a flock of seagulls, I'm, <laughs> I'm chucking it. That was magnificent. Uh, but of course, what a game we could have because Motherwell, 3 nothing up, they should have had the points in the bag. And Theo Bear, who I have to hold my hands up, Lee, I thought doesn't look like the, the finished article, but boy, they've worked on him. Me as well. I'm, I'm your camp with that. I need to hold my hands up. Um, I've never seen him as anywhere near a goal scorer now he's, what is it, 6-6? Six and six. Mm -hmm. um, Impressive stuff, big purple patches, get paces, get power. The only thing that was lacking at the start of the season was consistent goals, he's bringing that now. He'll be a threat tomorrow. I can just see Hearts at home, full-time castle, moving the ball quickly, they're fresh, everything is going in their favour just now. They're getting a little bit of luck, they've got Shanklin up front, who's and his purple patch, to be fair to him. Yeah. Um, Prediction? 3-1 Hearts. I'm in your case. You just want me to stop there? Is that why you cut me off with prediction? Yeah, because I'm looking at the clock and I'm oh, thinking... Right. If I, you're I wasn't looking at the clock. I was just getting carried well, you know what away. You're I just wanted me to contribute. I just want looking to contribute. <laughs> do you know what you're reminding me of? You're, you're reminding me of Lee McCulloch in the young days of Motherwell. He'd done on a maze <laughs> and then not knowing where everybody is. Didn't lift his head. Right, Any chance right. you could pass it, Lee. Because yeah. Jed Brannan's out there and so is Doug. Jed Brannan. He's a local manager now. Is he? Well, it's not too far before he gets a bump as well. 
result, sir. <laughs> Do nothing Hearts, but more interested in the team lines to see who's in goals tomorrow for Hearts. Oh, you think oh, there's going to be a... Oh, you've heard something, you think, there's, you think there's going to be a change? Well, he's played two cup games. It'll be interesting to see what he's doing in training. He's not going to change a winning team. Xander, Xander's I'm going goal. Xander. Do you want to have a wee bet on it? No, not at all, no. No, no, OK. Uh, Ruffy, do you think that Craig Gordon will go to the Euros instead of Liam Kelly? He's got to be playing first team football. So that's a no. So that's a no. Yeah. Unless he's in. Yeah. I think he's gone. Yeah. Instead of Liam Kelly. Yep. I don't think Liam Kelly's been great this season. I, think <coughs> I thought he was at fault maybe for a goal the other night as well. But Craig Gordon. It's a massive call. If it's right now, it's got to be Liam Kelly. Yeah. Because, think, because he's playing. I think, he, I think he's been on record to say the players that I pick have got to be playing top class football. Well, he's playing playing Scottish Cup. He might get away with it. There might be it's a not wee... enough, Peter. I if know. you've been it for over a year and you're coming back, well, I'll tell you what, you've it, got to play. We haven't got a pint. Of, we haven't got a pint of lager with us, but you go and Liam Kelly. Right, if it's right now, yeah, right now, no, I'd be going Liam. No, end let, of let, let's just end say end of season. season. Let's just. Well, oh, Xander gets injured. I know, but let's have a wee pint on. You know, I'll go Liam Kelly. I'll, I'll go Gordon. I think Gordon's going. No, no, Liam Kelly. Angus Gunn. Craig <laughs> Gordon. Uh huh. And you're Santa not holding him up. Yeah, I know. I know. Him he's, you know he's like. Well, that's because. <laughs> and who did you go? That's, that's because quite a lot of people. Craig Gordon. Craig Gordon, because that's a lot of people in here are actually just looking and saying, you know, is Bon Jovi reforming? Because look at his cover <laughs> as well. You need to have a long, hard look at yourself. Um, <coughs> read some of the comments. They're, they're, they're pretty, off, pretty, honest, pretty, pretty honest. scathing, to pretty be perfectly scathing. honest with you. Um, okay, we've given the prediction here. Dundee against Ross County. Dundee six, three points ahead of Motherwell. Um, and it's against Ross County who yeah. are looking to Don Cowie to try and save the day for them. Yeah, the uh, beginning of the season I had uh, Dundee to be relegated. Uh, I'm now saying they're a top six team. Yep, yep. OK. Uh, yourself? <laughs> I'm going to go 2-1 Dundee. 3-1 uh, Dundee. <clears throat> I'll go 2-1 Dundee. 2-1 Dundee. Um, They're not talking as much now we're in the half. <laughs> <laughs> no. Livingston again. 2-1 some man. Yep. <laughs> Next, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that. I don't know about you, Ruffy, but I thought um, I thought Stephen Robinson was first class on the show on Monday. Yeah, I stayed up to watch the show later on. You know, obviously I get bumped. But, uh, I stayed up and it was a good show. Uh, it just lacked, you know it lacked, no, it lacked a wee bit. Of, <laughs> he knew, uh, <laughs> but it was. Charisma, it was it all, it, the, the, I think the, he has. The guys are telling us about the, the view, the viewings, and the, the hits and all that. It's an all-time high. Yeah, that, it, that show on Monday. See, to be honest with you, though, he, he was he gave us a great insight yes. into the whole manager aspect of things. I thought he was top draw. He did, Peter. And he, we spoke about <laughs> and we speak about all the time coaches, young coaches now, and I, and I see them and I hear them talking about the philosophy in the game. They want to play out for the back and all that. That will get you the sack. I know it's, it's good having a philosophy, but if you've not got the players to play out for the back, don't play out for the back. And listen, I don't think St. Murnard particularly great in the eye, but he's very, very effective. And that's why he's having the longevity in the game, Peter. He's been at Motherwell and he's been down south. He's at St. Murnard now doing well. He plays to his strengths at St. Murnard, and I yep. think that's vital for a manager. And he could uh, give St. Mirren their highest finish uh, in the SPL since St. Mirren were in uh, their pomp in the 1980s. I've got them 2 1, Ruffy. 2 1 for me, yeah. 2 1 for me. Okay. Um, let's have a look at the old uh, Premiership table. Here's how it fares just before we finish. As you can see, Livingston desperately needs to, to get wins from somewhere to put the pressure on the teams above them. And at the top, ho oh, ho, there you have it. You wanted a title race between the two of them. And you've got it. It's looking good. And Hearts and Kilmarnock and St Mirren uh, and then Dundee battling it out their top six. Motherwell and Hibs and Aberdeen might have something to say about it as well. Um, OK, uh, the predictor. Here's how it looks, boys, because uh, Tam, you're out in front. Ruffy's just in behind. You can all change. And look at that. Uh, I'm in the third place. Then it's Lee who's doing superbly well. Alison and then Kerry. I'm coming for you. And I have to say, Aurora Borealis. Can you pick the team? Did she, did she come at, out with that? Well, look at Aurora Borealis. I mean, that is good. I'll catch him you. for you, Peter. You think so? I'll save you a few, Bob. If you could do that, by the way, uh, it would be absolutely <laughs> fantastic. Um, <laughs> Lee, just quickly, um, what do you make of the quarter final uh, draw? Aberdeen Kilmarnock, Celtic Livingston, Hibs Rangers, and Morton Hearts. Aberdeen Kilmarnock is the Saturday at 12 15. Celtic Livy is the Sunday at 2.30. Hibs Rangers is the Sunday, 10th of March at 5.30. Super Sunday, that is. And then Monday, March the 11th, it's Morton Hearts at 7.45. Yep. Uh, great weekend of football. I think 
tough games. Aberdeen at home, I think Kilmarnock will go through there. Yep. Celtic, easily. Rangers, I think they'll go through. And I think Hearts will have enough at Morton, but that's a really, really difficult game. Yeah, absolutely. Um, listen, I think from everybody on the, the football show, uh, I think anybody who loves their football would like to wish um, Roy Hodgson um, a speedy recovery from his illness at the moment. Oliver Glasner um, will obviously, I think, take the, the, the training at the moment. He's 76, Ruffy. He's had an illness. Um, he's had a wee bit of pressure in the last <clears> few months, so uh, you know he's now in hospital and getting good care. Hopefully, he'll be back out all right. It just shows you the passion he's got for the game. You know, he's been in it a long time, a uh, lot of good clubs, and uh, for for him put himself through that is absolutely fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, don't forget to hit the subscribe button on PLZ Soccer's YouTube channel as ever. Thank you for your comments, most of them all sensible and, of course, without abusing anyone, apart from the clobber we're all wearing. Um, of course, I always like to mention, if anybody's wearing gear that's just a mile out, Ruffy, quite happy with your... Uh, golf look. Your golf look. Sports direct. Yeah. Let's um, John Bon Jovi. I'm just... Uh, well, I'm just John Norton. Just Jake Ball. <laughs> absolutely. And, of course... Big Jigs went Vivian Westwood today. Oh, just He's up to these games. Is that for Turkey? <laughs> yeah. It's Vivian Eastwood. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. We'll leave you with that thought. Um, and uh, of course, do uh, tune in. Kerry uh, is there with the uh, Saturday morning preview on our YouTube channel. Yeah, I get you tomorrow. Yeah. And don't forget also that coming up this week, we'll get some fantastic interviews. Right now, Jim McAnally is our straight talk. Uh, we've got the Champions League special there for you to enjoy. And there's also the journals as well as the women's football show. So much variety on offer on PLZ Soccer's YouTube channel. Thanks for listening and watching.